So, we are ready. Two o'clock. Many presentations have been uploaded. Great. So, just a gentle reminder. Presentations about three minutes. You can run them from here, from the laptop, on control. I'll just upload them, show them on the screen, and then you can take it over from there. And I will try to make with visual signs how many minutes you have. Good. Um, just following the order on Meet Echo. Um, first, I'd like to invite the people from the Riot Hackathon presentations, or the Hackathon Riot table. All right, there we go. You're the first, but then you're done with it. So it's a, it's a great, great to start. Yeah. So yeah, there, we, there we go. I put the timer here. You see? Okay, okay. Okay, there you go. Okay. It's up to you. Well, hi. So um, we are students from the Technical University in Dresden, Germany, and um, our project is to um, design and implement a high-level co-op API for the Riot operating system. So um, the problem is that currently um, an application um, is restricted to use only um, a, a single library for co-op, um, which also restricts it to a specific or some um, yeah, a very little amount of uh, transport protocols or transport methods. And um, we want to change that um, so that an application can just build on top of our unified API. And um, the API basically combines um, the functions and transports of the multiple libraries um, so that we have a simple to use and um, yeah, very broad library for co-op. Um, for this, we, we started with a server API. We defined um, some structures and interfaces um, to basically uh, register resources and, um, and, and start the server so that uh, the resources um, are accessible from other clients. Um, for this, we, we have an um, example server code um, where basically you can just, uh, is my mouse visible? I think not. Uh, so basically, in the in the first line of the main, you can just um, define the server, and um, after that, you can um, set set up drivers, which yeah, map to the underlying libraries that are used to the different uh, transport protocols. So basically, we can say use the G Coop library for the UDP transport, or use lib Coop for TCP transport, and um, after that, we can. Uh, register different resources over the different transports and uh, methods and after that we start the server basically. So um, yeah, what still needs to be discussed is uh, the, the transport solution that we implemented and maybe we should focus more on a security aspect there. Um, our plans for the hackathon or basically for our whole project was to design the uh, very high level API um, that is easy to use and flexible and in the end also runs on the required operating system. On the hackathon, we now designed our API interface and um, yeah, made it quite simple to use. At least that's what we hope. <laughs> um, those are our team members and this is our uh, GitHub repo with our current code and also a nice picture of our team. Thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot. Okay, next. Uh, let's see. Yes. Next up is the comprehensive evaluation of MSR6. Is that a remote presentation or someone in the room? Uh, let's see if the hand is raised. It's a remote presentation. Excellent. Hello. Hi. There you go. You, uh, I will 
Start the timer. Okay, you have three minutes. Okay, I will, um, I will can you see the screen? Yeah. I can hand over. Oh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My something here. Full screen. You're in control now. I think we lost contact here. I don't know. Uh, try another option. Okay, this doesn't work, sorry. Um, I'll stop. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, the network is not well. Is not. Um, can I see the screen? Uh, this slide shows the main works and some useful links. Um, for the work, the first we first implement several MSRC solutions on hardware uh, using the people language and evaluate their hardware performance. Um, then we simulate and compare beer and the four MSR schemes uh, show in the links at the software level based on the real network topology. Oh. I granted you access. Oh. Yep. Yep. I can go to the next page. The software, um, I'm so uh, for the software based evaluation, we conducted uh, micro mathematical solutions on five uh, multicast PE schemes. Um, we evaluated these five schemes from the perspective of multicast um, uh, policy loans, parsing times, visibility of compressions, and uh, complexity, of, uh, uh, complexity of the pointer precisely in the data center network topology and the randomly generated network topology, respectively. And here are the conclusions. Um, and, uh, and this is our team. If you have some interest or puzzles about our works, uh, contact us. So that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, next presentation is Dynamic Network Routing, ITF. Is it in here in the room? Excellent. There we go. I'll put the timer for you. Yeah, thank you. So, okay. yeah, you can just, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our project uh, is Dynamic Network Routing. This work is mainly finished by Huawei and Nanjing University.
So what is dynamic network? Dynamic network means topology of network changes frequently. The main use cases may include a resource constrained network, uh, an energy saving network, and a satellite network. Uh, this is our Hexen plan. We simulated the dynamic network based on NS3 and com combined with uh, uh, existing routing protocols. And uh, finally, we evaluated the existing routing protocols with, uh, in the dynamic network. And uh, here is our Hexen development environment. We, uh, we run it uh, based on Ubuntu 20. And uh, this is our simulation introduction. We take the satellite network as an example. We configured about 66 satellites and 50 ground stations. Okay. And uh, we have about uh, 20, uh, 215 UDP flows around the world. And uh, we have five routing protocols, and all algorithms uh, include distributed routing protocols uh, and uh, centralized routing protocols. And uh, this page shows uh, our uh, result. Uh, it's, really, it's hard to say which one is better because uh, they have different performance uh, from different uh, dimensions. Uh, but uh, the package loss is a common problem. Uh, okay, what we what we learned from uh, from this project, we found that package loss may occur when we use existing protocols running directly in a dynamic network. Many we may need to take the advantage of predictable changes in the dynamic network to prevent it. And uh, we found uh, another point is that routing protocols with the link attribute awareness capability usually have better performance. So in the future, we will continue to improve the existing routing protocols to adapt to the domestic network. And uh, also uh, want to cooperate with partners who are interested in domestic network. Uh, okay, this page is our team member and our related drafts. Anyone who is interested in this area, welcome to contact and join us. Thank you for your attention. Okay. okay. Next up is the... Six three ad hoc IoT presentation. Is that in the room? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, it's a long walk, a large room. No, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So you're welcome. So I start the timer. You can use the the arrows. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is uh, Andreas Broker. I'm on the list here together with my colleague Marian sitting over there. We work on this uh, ad hoc IoT, which is derived from this uh, um, internet graph you see here. And by the way, next week we'll publish a new version with the findings which we could achieve uh, here in this meeting. I will mention it and um, try to go down the arrows. No, here. Yeah. So what is this uh, six tree network? It is a, a private routing uh, network in a, a tree structure so, uh, and uh, with um, based on IPv6. So that's the name. And um, it starts with a, a root node. Um, which has this uh, IPv6 address uh, in the interesting mapping, which is, uh, was proposed in 1999 by South Korea Telecom authorities. It is to map the telephone number in the IPv6 prefix. And uh, we implemented this and uh, came here with two access points. 
which are described here, with, uh, which are linked to German telephone numbers. And uh, with the help of Marcin from ISC, and that's he's somewhere here, uh, we managed to improve the, the access to local devices. So this uh, left hand device could, uh, thanks to router advertisement and IP DHCPv6, uh, quickly address uh, devices in the small local network. Uh, okay, the IPv6 addresses are very long. Uh, here we have chosen a format where the last part contains the MAC address for simplicity. And it's, the whole work is not done because the uh, ultra low latency is, is still not achieved, but it's uh, in preparation, at least we have with hierarchical routing uh, in local area, we can achieve uh, low, lower latency. Um, so this already concludes the presentation. Um, so we have um, this interesting mapping and we verify it with a phone call so that the prefix is, is verified by a simple phone call. And by the way, we also make money out of it, but that's not the technology here. Uh, the benefits, it's very simple. Uh, even unaware, IP unaware people can see that the browser just has a phone number in the, in the line. And um, the address is verified, so legally verified, which is important for IoT, because if you actuate something, you not, uh, sh should know who it was. So it's ideal for IoT. Um, you can try it out, but only if you have a German telephone number. But at the same time, you are, we invite all other countries to implement this network. It's cheap and easy, <laughs> and then we could extend, because basically it's working worldwide. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Um, let's see next. Next is the uh, ASPA hackathon project. Yeah, okay, there we go. Um, yeah, you can just uh, go. So, uh, hello. We are also from Technical University Dresden, and we will quickly present what we achieved in the last uh, 48 hours. I will give a very quick introduction uh, on BGP. So, BGP allows you to announce prefix into the internet, and those prefixes then propagate through the internet. Um, there are different, so there's a problem because if you get one prefix from your provider and upstream this prefix to another provider, you become transit for those two providers and router traffic. And this becomes a problem if you have two very large providers because this will, if you're a small network, uh, overload you and impact the service quality. So here, uh, ASPA introduces a business logic for uh, verifying uh, if a route should be propagated or not. And a customer tells us which are its providers. Um, and here you can see a violation of the value free principle. So a BGP announcement is um, propagated upstream to their providers. Then the provider propagates the BGP announcement downstream, but this customer then uh, um, propagates the, this BGP announcement again uh, to its provider. And, this then, and now we can um, verify with this ASPA information that the value free principle is um, violated. And we uh, did an implementation in that in the RTR lab and Carl will talk a little bit uh, more about that. Yeah. So here you got a quick rundown of the ASPA object. Um, yeah, the ASPA objects basically express these uh, business relationships in the BGP network and are stored in a uh, PKI called the RPKI. Um, uh, during the hackathon, we planned on implementing the ASPath verification algorithm on top of the basic PDU support in RTRLib we've already added. Um, now, RTRLib is a library 
used for RTR communication with cache servers sitting on the edge of this RPKI infrastructure, storing these um, uh, ASPR records Tesla just talked about. And RTR is used in uh, BGP demons like BIRD and FFR. Yeah, and we also planned uh, to do some interrupt tests with uh, real world cache servers like uh, Rootinator and some BGP demons. Now we didn't quite uh, uh, reach our goals cause the uh, drafts uh, description of the verification algorithm turns out not to be that well written after all. So what did we learn? Yeah, well, three paragraphs in the draft can indeed lead to more than six hours of some intricate discussions about on how to interpret the verification algorithm in the draft. And I guess we have some uh, interesting discussions over the course of the next week ahead of us. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to thank uh, Tom and Teiji for helping us a little with the ASPA verification algorithm. And you can find our fork and the original RTL at the link shown here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Happy to see uh, Rudiger on a picture <laughs> talking with you. And happy to see the Routinator logo on your slides. Uh, okay. Some insights, information here. Um, right, next one is... Hackathon Rift, if I'm pronouncing that correct. Is that local or a remote presentation? Okay, excellent. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Sandy Zhang from ZTE. I'm glad to uh, summarize our Rift project on behalf of participants. Uh, we have participants from ZTE Juniper, and uh, we must have our special thanks to Bruno uh, for his excellent uh, open source code. So uh, what's Rift? Rift is a new IP routing protocol, and it's built specifically for the class or fat tree topologies. And the, the protocol has many advantages, such as it's extremely scalable, and he need no configuration, and it has fully modeled packet formats. Uh, we have three known implementations with dozens of participants in the hexa. And uh, the interoperational tests on different parts of the specification. Uh, the details of our project is uh, we have tests between Juniper and the open source. And uh, the test is uh, um, based on the newest draft. Uh, and so, and the, the test is fully virtual element on AWS. And the, the second test is between Juniper and ZTE. We use physical remote infra with real boxes and uh, Docker interfaces. And the ZTP plus adjacency establishment lead to improvement of an implementation in a corner case. And uh, we have test for flooding this aggregation with different cases. And also we found some um, problems such as uh, the test is limited by Docker problems with multiple interfaces exposed. And uh, also we have lots of discussion on the new Dragonfly Plus topology. So that's all the project uh, details. And uh, we have many thanks to our participants. Uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. You can find the information through the link. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, just check my email. I see some people are submitting their slides via a pull request. That doesn't work. Just upload them directly to the GitHub repository. Don't use the pull request, please. Um, da -da -dum. Good. Rift, we had the Hackathon Roca S uh, presentation. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, so I would like to talk about the encryption algorithm and so first the short introduction of the algorithm. So it's based on the sponge construction with 256-bit key and generate 256-bit tag. And so in security, uh, it can provide 256-bit security against key recovery and uh, one 92-bit security against forgery attacks. Uh, so it's very fast and very secure algorithms, and this specification can be found in the internet draft, and also uh, we have the reference implementation on GitHub, and the paper of the algorithm is presented at Ezrix this year. So during the hackathon, uh, we tried to include the Rockwise algorithm into uh, OpenSSL as one of the cipher suites and evaluate the performance and also confirm the TLS connection between the server and the client. And the, as the future plan, so this is not part of the hackathon, but uh, we are trying to make this uh, implementation to the open source. So what got done is, so we success, successfully add the algorithm to the uh, quick TLS and confirm that it's actually add it and also evaluate the performance. And uh, it's about 200 gigabps on uh, Intel Core i7 processor. And also uh, confirm the connection between the S client and the server uh, using the, the, the implemented algorithms. Uh, yes, and this is the acknowledgement. Thank you very much. Good. Up next is, let's see, okay. the sign deploy, deployment guide presentation. Excellent. Get the timer. There you go. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, today we're going to talk about the uh, deployment guide we built for Scion. Uh, Scion is a pathware uh, network that uh, provides um, pri the experience of a private network across a public network. Which button do I push to? <clears throat> um, so currently there exist um, a couple of different Scion environments. Uh, if you want to run Scion, you can run a development environment in a Docker-based container pulling on, on a laptop. Uh, we also have Scion Lab, which is an interface, an internet overlay network. But we've had a lot of people in the Scion community want something in between. They want uh, to be able to run their own isolated Scion network to do various uh, types of security attacks or DDoS attacks and red team attacks to test the security of the environment. Uh, and neither of those environments are appropriate. So today, we, uh, starting yesterday, we uh, embarked on a, uh, on a path to put together a deployment guide to deploy this in a private environment. So we built a guide to deploy this across uh, Equinix Metal, bare metal infrastructure, as well as uh, AWS. So this guide explains how to install the software, uh, generate all the certificate keys, uh, build the configuration files, and we successfully gone and deployed across those two environments. Um, the environment we put together, it's a uh, 
five AS environment across um, one isolation domain with uh, three core routers and uh, two leaf routers. Um, so what do we learn from all of this? Um, we, we learned that you know, it's totally doable to go and put together an isolated environment that uh, developers and researchers can use, test it all out. Uh, working with the development team, we found a number of uh, undocumented shortcuts that make it easier to deploy the software. Uh, so we've been uh, documenting those shortcuts <laughs> so we can use them. Uh, and working with the developers, uh, they're working on a related uh, project on Sign as well here as well. So working closely with them made, uh, made our life easier. Um, uh, so a combination of people, I'm with uh, Martin Court Networks, we had uh, Simon from uh, Switch and uh, Corrine and uh, Nicole from, uh, Nicola from uh, the Sign Association, uh, and two of us were uh, first timers at the, uh, the uh, hackathon conference. Next up, the SAF Open Playground Hackathon project. So, gives me time to set a timer. There we go. Can you use the okay. camera slot? Right. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Li Bingliu from Zhongguan Zhen Lab. And uh, I will share our hackathon experience on our project, the Open Playground. OK, uh, let's quickly review our hackathon plan. Uh, we are going to run the emulations of some mechanisms based on the uh, OP and evaluate the different sound mechanisms with the OP in terms of following aspects, including validation accuracy, control plane, and data plane performance, and the scalability of the OP. Okay, then uh, let's quick go through the overview of SAR OP. Uh, SAR OP provides the web app for users to build a network topology and configure their networks. And based on the network configurations, the OP can uh, emulate various sound scenarios automatically. And within SAR OP, a uh, configuration database can store the sound scenarios for replaying on the, uh, on the web and it all uh, in some, so OP provides a virtualized uh, network platform to enable easy implementation and uh, emulate uh, and the emulation of different some mechanisms and uh, is open source on GitHub. Uh, what got done uh, first, uh, we have built an internet topology uh, which includes 200S using the real BJP data from public route collectors provided by route rails and the route rails. In order to build a topology, uh, we parse and extract AS path attribute from the BJP data and obtain the uh, neighboring relation between AS and then create links for the neighboring AS to build the s level internet topology. Besides, we also obtain the business relationship between AS according to the data from CADA. Second, we have run the emulations of different sound mechanisms uh, with the 200S network topology. And we also emulate different network scenarios, including symmetric routing, uh, no export, and direct server routine. Third, we have performed emulations, evaluations of sound mechanisms with some OP in terms of validation accuracy, control plane, and data plane performance, and the scalability. Uh, what have we learned? Our uh, first, uh, we learned that a server with 256 gigabytes DDR4 RAM can run uh, 200 SAL OP containers with our current implementation. And we will make SAL OP support emulations cross machines. Second, our experiment, experimental results show that Passport and DSAL perform in terms of SAL accuracy. Yes, yet Passport exhibits a low data plane forwarding performance because it requires the router to perform the cryptographic computation on each packet, which increases the processing overhead. The communication overhead of this out can be reduced. Okay, uh, uh, welcome to join us in promoting this project and uh, uh, feel free to share any ideas with us. Thank you very much.
Uh, oh, again. Sign again, but now another presentation. Sign RPC presentation. the time with three minutes. All right. Um, I'm Dominic from Anapaya. Um, we were also working on Cyan, which is just a secure interdomain routing protocol. Um, and we try to improve the RPC stack in the control plane. So what was the plan for this hackathon? Um, currently, we are using gRPC over HTTP2 over Quick over Cyan, which uh, is not that nice. Uh, what we did now in this hackathon is actually build a proper RPC stack that is just using HTTP3 um, directly over Quick over Cyan. And for this, we built um, just a prototype based on Connect. And it was super nice. Um, we actually finished the project and we have prototyped this. It works, of course. Uh, we still need to fi finalize the code. Um, but the key learnings were that Quick is super nice. HTTP3 is also great. And everything is very easy to integrate with each other. So yeah, everything is composable. And it we got it to work. Um, our team was fully built from newcomers, um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, I hope it was a good experience as a newcomer to work here during the weekend. Right, uh, this next presentation is quick additional addresses. Is that remote or it's in person? Excellent. So uh, hello, I will report on uh, the progress that we did that we did at uh, table 19. So um, at table 19, I would like also to uh, um, uh, thanks give thanks to uh, the people from TU Munich that uh, spontaneously joined our, re re um, our project. Um, so the goal of um, our hackathon was to implement and do some interrupt testing with the quick additional addresses extension. So. This is an extension that we uh, proposed in a, in a draft, which defines a new frame for quick servers to announce additional addresses. Um, so here in our um, uh, little example, we have a server, um, so a client that is establishing a quick connection to a server, and then the server can send new additional addresses, and then the client can use them. Um, use them depends on the client capacity, so if the client is single path, it can migrate to this additional address. If the client is multipath, such as a multipath quick, I mean, it can establish new paths to those additional addresses. There are several use cases for that. Um, one is clients simply losing one address family when they move from one network to the other and then one address family becomes uh, unavailable. Others are um, um, IPv6 multi um mobile peer-to-peer -peer servers that need to move, and also, of course, multipath quick servers that have several interfaces. Um, so the, um, the implementation inter went great. Uh, we had five open source implementations that were participating, or more precisely, participants that modified those five implementations. And we got interrupt with uh, single path and multipath quick uh, endpoints. Here are the results. So we defined three tests. F is a simple test exchanging the new frame. A uh, performs migration using the additional address that, that is received. And then M performs multipath with establishing a new uh, path towards the new address. Um, so here are the results. If you're interested in this uh, extension, let's get in touch with us. We're still at the table for some time and read the draft. 
if you want to implement it or have uh, more interest in it. Thank you. Thanks. Next one is the semantic metadata annotation presentation. Excellent. Yep. Yeah, just uh, no, yeah, it's there goes. Okay, thanks. Hey folks, uh, so this presentation is about uh, a project we developed here uh, in relation to this draft, which is about network anomaly semantics. And just to give you a little bit of context about it, um, if you will ever decide to get yourself into the business of automated network anomaly detection, you will soon find yourself trying to answer these two questions. First one being, how do I know that I'm doing a good job? And second one being, how do I know how I'm improving or how can I, I, I can improve on the results? And one step towards the solution of these problems is what we've been doing, presenting a young model for um, standardizing a way we can exchange information about network anomalies um, between different people, between different network engineers, or even between humans and machines. So like uh, between network engineers and anomaly detection systems and, and vice versa. Um, so let's say you want to build the ground truth that you want to use for training models, or you want to uh, validate the results of an anomaly detection to further improve your, your ground truth. These are two main scenarios here. Um, so the plan for uh, the, uh, the, the, the hackathon for us was to uh, finalize the semantic uh, for, and, and, the, and the young models and in particular, we define two young models, one to define what we call symptoms and one to define what we call incidents. And uh, we have been implementing a small proof of concept uh, which allows to uh, annotate real time, well, annotate time series data uh, from the network and as specify when the symptoms and the incidents are found. And, uh, and these can actually uh, get stored and, and, and shared with the other people and actors. Um, the software that we built uh, relies on some already existing open source tools like InfluxDB for storing time series data, Grafana to visualize the, uh, the, the time series and to annotate the, the symptoms and incidents. And we built a, a, a service, a, um, a, yeah, a service called Antagonist, which is about supporting this uh, enrichment of metadata for symptoms and incidents. Um, and it's available on GitHub as, as an open source project at, at the link you see in the slide. Uh, the first step, of, of course, is to you load the telemetry data on InfluxDB. The second step is you tag those symptoms and incidents on, on Grafana. And then Antagonist will read from the Grafana annotation database and will enrich the information and will push the, the information enriched on the database itself. And it will expose eventually through a REST API, which supports the young model we defined. This is an example of how you can easily annotate incidents uh, and symptoms. So you can specify there's spikes, you can specify drops and so forth. Uh, and everything is in line with the, the dimension young models. Um, and uh, we are currently planning to have like a couple of um, next steps uh, in the development of this project, in particular the improvement of the code. There's a little bit of improvement we can, we can do, we identified already. And uh, we would like to integrate this soon with the real anomaly detection systems. So this is the team that has been working on the project, thanks to uh, Alex, Wanting, Thomas and myself, Vincenzo. Thanks guys. ILNP presentation. Okay, 
Hello, everyone. Um, ILNP is the Identifier Locator Network Protocol. This is a set of experimental RFCs that we've been working on for a while. And in fact, the last time we were able to do anything was uh, four years ago in Prague. So it's lovely to be back and engage with the ITF. That time we had something working on a Linux kernel. Um, and today we were able to get something working on a FreeBSD 14 kernel, which is a FreeBSD 14 current kernel. And so far we've only had um, tests done within the lab, but today we were able to do tests across um, IPv6 from here to Scotland, which was very useful. The team, um, Greg Hayward, my student, who's done most of the BSD development, uh, is remote. Then me and Rio were on site here and setting up the demo and conducting the experiments. ILMP does a bunch of things, and the thing we wanted to test today was the basic connectivity with um, IPv6 between here and Scotland, where the server is. So we had a client, several clients here, and we had one server based in Scotland. The experiments were to test basic connectivity because ILNP extends IPv6, including with some destination options. So we wanted to see, can they make it across the network? And we wanted to test with some basic applications, ping, rsync, SSH. Those are unmodified, they use standard C sockets. And we also have a little tweak in here for the BSD kernel that we're using ephemeral node identifiers. So basically the lower 64 bits of an IPv6 address are generated dynamically for every single flow for increased privacy. And so we wanted to test all those features and that was the experiment. The results were that everything pretty much worked. So if there's only really one way to include, why Shark was happy, it short saw everything. So that's me. Thank you. Well, nice results. Thanks. We, we, there we are. Measuring ODNS, measuring transparent forwarders. Hello everyone, we are also with the Technical University of Dresden and our team is working on a toolkit to measure transparent forwarders in the OpenDNS infrastructure. The OpenDNS infrastructure is essentially all those public DNS servers that respond to queries from basically any origin. So for example, if you know Google's DNS or Cloudflare's DNS, but there are many, many more. And one important component in this OpenDNS infrastructure are transparent forwarders. And what transparent forwarders do is they essentially spoof the source address by uh, keeping it to the same as it was uh, on the original yeah, client that sent the request so that the open recursive resolver sends back the uh, response directly to the client that made the request. And that is actually a big problem because this can be used uh, for DDoS amplification attacks. Yeah, and as you can see, to prevent such attacks, we are basically measuring them. And so we can identify the transparent forwarders and basically notify the the people that are yeah, using them to disable them. And our goals for the ITF hackathon were to extend the tool to support DNS over TCP and DNS over Quick. So we basically only got DNS over TCP working because we wanted to get it working stably and fast enough to run it on a server. Yeah, and yeah, this was our team. 
And if you want to learn more about our results and see some measurements or read the paper, you can check out the first link you see over here, or you can check out our repository. Thank you. Thank you. Open roaming, Madidas presentation. Okay. Yeah, by the size of the room, it's quite an exercise to get here on stage. It gives me time to set the timer. There we go. So, there we go. We used to Right, thanks. Uh, yeah, so my name's Mark from Cisco. Uh, let's uh, talk about what we've done this week in the Open Roaming Medinas Hackathon. Um, sorry, you said I could just... Um, next page. Okay, so a little bit about Open Roaming. If you're not familiar, um, it's a federation of uh, Wi-Fi access network providers and identity providers. Uh, it uh, is a, there's a legal framework and a technical framework. And obviously, we've been focusing on the technical framework. The technical framework defines use of dynamic discovery using DNS uh, and mapped to SLV. Um, it's based on RADSEC end-to-end -end, uh, with a PKI using uh, a WBA private CA. Um, and it's based on Passpoint. So uh, Passpoint defines something called Roaming Consortium Organizational Identifiers, RCOIs, bit of a mouthful. Um, but that's what we use to automatically trigger the authentication to the networks. Um, so the hackathon aims was to really analyze the possible leakage of privacy information across the federation. So that's between open roaming IDPs and ANPs. Um, and this is a production service. So we've got to put probes um, on real world networks, access network providers, identity providers. Uh, and you can see the scribble there from our, from our uh, presentation that we're looking at uh, radius usernames, correlations, we're looking at chargeable user identifiers, we're looking at class attributes. Um, so what did we learn? Well, uh, we had, by the end of the afternoon, in fact, we had radius logs exchanged with 13 different IDPs, production IDPs, um, and that enabled us to observe very different implementations uh, in those uh, different uh, identity providers. Uh, we had two identity providers with explicit opt-in with the IDP terms and conditions to share email identifiers, and that email identifier is actually signaled using the chargeable user ID attribute. Um, we have nine out of the 10 reported here actually returning chargeable user identifiers. Uh, in most cases, the CUI is a hash of some account ID. Um, a single IDP doesn't re return chargeable user identifier, but uses class uh, to return what looks like a hash of the user identifier plus some other fields. Um, and we also saw um, uh, open roaming authentications from two different cellular providers, uh, and those are two different PLMN IDs. Um, and great news from a privacy protection perspective is that the, those PLMNs are using the hashing of the uh, IMSI so IMSI privacy protection, so you don't see IMSI in the outer EAP identifier. Uh, but when we look at the radius logs, we see static CUI. In fact, we actually also see IMSI in the clear uh, in one instance of a class and another instance of a class uh, with a varying string. Uh, next steps, uh, we're gonna continue this discussion in Medinas this week on Thursday, so please come along. Uh, and then from a hackathon perspective, we're looking to uh, extend uh, the scope to look at uh, new work uh, around um, Radius COA, COA over RADSEC, uh, as well as DNSSEC and Radius 1.1. Uh, and finally, uh, we were, it's fair to say, a group of first timers. So uh, here you can see the names. So thanks to everyone who participated. And you can see then the four open roaming ANP networks that we uh, built. Thanks a lot. Excellent, thank you.
happy to see so many newcomers also on stage giving presentations. And next one is the ultra low latency crypto presentation. Is that? Yeah, thanks. Great. <laughs> You're out of breath before you start, so please take your time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Yumi Sakemi from GMO Cybersecurity by ERA. Uh, I will talk about our Hackson project titled Ultra Low Latency Crypto Arrayon. Uh, Arrayon is a secure and low latency cryptographic scheme and cryptographic permutation based AES instructions such as AES-NI. As features of Arrayon, it can be applied to encryption and hashing. Uh, for more details, uh, please refer the IDF 117 Hackathon slide and our internet trust. Uh, as a use case of Arrayon, uh, we expected that Arrayon could be uh, useful for the use case that requires real time secure communication, such as esports, uh, remote surgery, and so on. So, uh, in this hackathon, uh, our goal is to prepare an environment of WebRTC with Arrayon so that everyone can try Arrayon with WebRTC protocol. Uh, we use uh, OSS of WebRTC by Google. In this case, uh, first, we need, to pro uh, we need to deploy Arrayon to Boring SSL, and then we need to verify whether WebRTC can be executed using Boring SSL with Arrayon. As a result, uh, we successfully added Arrayon to Boring SSL, and uh, we checked that a sample code of server and client uh, successfully connected with DTRS with Arrayon, but Unfortunately, we have some errors at the level of WebRTC. Uh, this slide shows next steps. Uh, we should do debugging of WebRTC with Arrayon, and uh, especially we need volunteers to implement independent implementations. So if you are interested in our activities, please contact us. Uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, there. Step C. Step C. That's Sorry, I pronounce it incorrect. Is it remote or in person? In person, excellent. Yeah, maybe I pronounce it wrong. <laughs> no, okay, thank you. Hi, so I am Emil from Orange. So with uh, my friend from the table, uh, 29, we worked on the what uh, Mark initiated uh, in uh, San Francisco. So it's about adapting quick for deep space uh, transport. Uh, and so, uh, let's see. So the problem we are trying to solve is to tune quick using TAPS API 
for using Quick in deep space. And so the specific uh, issue is to support uh, extremely long delay, uh, sometimes without no acknowledgement, or very long uh, dis description. And so we plan to solve that uh, implementing tabs on the top of Quick and uh, identifying uh, the parameters, the profile, and uh, the feature which are missing and which need to be added. And uh, what we did uh, this time, so we started to merge uh, Python AsyncEO tabs and IEO quick. And uh, this, the bonus, I think, is that we are looking to, to implement a careful resume in the next uh, step. And uh, so what is planned? <laughs> I already mostly told about it. So we, what, uh, so you see what we try to do is to get interrupt with uh, what Christian implemented uh, a year ago. So it triggered its quick implementation and with uh, the support of very long delay. And uh, this is our goal on the short term. And then we will try to, to support uh, the, the work of uh, Anna and Gori about uh, careful to resume. And, um, and so what we need to go further, but probably later, is to have support from the, 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 the working group to, uh, to write good extension to tabs or, or to quick and uh, to get feedback from uh, DTN to map the parts of DTN uh, which are missing. And that is. Well. So, I, I am over the delay? No, no, still 15 seconds <laughs> <laughs> before. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Next presentation is Ticos. Ticosi. I sorry, I, I keep forgetting how to pronounce it. <laughs> but I'm close, I can, I guess. So TCOSI is an implementation of COSI, a uh, Seabor-based uh, message encryption and signing protocol. Um, been working on it in uh, the um, hackathon for a few years now, maybe maybe one and a half, two years. Uh, this hackathon, we added um, non-AEAD encryption uh, mode for it. Um, that's uh, AES counter mode and AES CBC modes. Um, mostly, uh, COSI uses uh, AEAD algorithms, so the headers and such can be protected, but there's some use cases uh, like, like uh, disk encryption and other, uh, other forms of encryption where you already have some integrity protection where you, the uh, counter mode and CBC are valuable. Uh, Ken Takayama, I believe he's with SecCom in Japan, not here today, um, did a large part of the work. Um, he kind of hears the uh, Tikozi story on our route from Tikozi 1.0 to 2.0. Um, so mostly, so this, this go round was mostly counter mode and CBC. Um, there'll be a, an alpha 2 release of Tikozi 2.0. Uh, in the next uh, day or two with all of this work on the GitHub, uh, on Tcozy GitHub. Uh, and uh, you can see the, the algorithm's progress. We, we added uh, counter mode. Uh, just a Tcozy uh, uh, 2.0 is alpha quality right now, and um, we're uh, working on getting it to commercial quality, mostly test and documentation uh, to go. That's it, thank you. Thanks.
stickers in here. Next one, next presentation is the MTL mode presentation. And Use the arrows left and right for the slides. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Um, we are working on MTL mode. MTL mode is a, a method we are working on for post quantum signatures to reduce the impact on the underlying protocol. At IETF 117, we came with a draft, and this just last week we open sourced a reference implementation of that. So this hackathon was around using that open source representation and um, discussing that. So um, there is some stuff in, in the IPR dec declared around the MTL mode. If you want to read out more about it, you can see the, the uh, declarations. So what we got done, we were able to demonstrate the library and use the example application. Uh, we discussed some future collaborations that we'd like to put together. Um, and we discussed how it works from the draft. Uh, again, we just open sourced it last week. It's pretty new, so uh, go check it out. We'll be here all week if you'd like to discuss more with us what MTL mode is or this library. Um, and then what we learned, it's new. We're still working through uh, educating the community and seeing where it fits well. Um, but we realized that we need to work on the cryptographic library uh, integrations, what libraries that we want to line it up with, um, what are the language bindings we need to use with the library. Uh, there's a draft that we'll be needing to create around how to use it with DNSSEC. And we'll be looking for some future partners to work on the DNSSEC uh, implementation of MTMO potentially. So again, it, we look forward to some follow-up discussions around that. And uh, if you're interested, we'll be around all week. Please come find myself or Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, IPv6 only on Linux. Hello, my name is Andrei Tsaotka. Um, um, I'm a newcomer to this, uh, to this uh, hackathon and I tried to uh, sign up with the project of improving IPv6 experience on Linux. So what is the issue? Well, maybe if you tried to connect the IETF-NET64 network with your Linux laptop, maybe everything works for you. Maybe you can see some more issues like if you type in IP4 literal somewhere, it just doesn't work or if you use some low-level applications like VirtualBox or some VPN clients, maybe they're not working well. Uh, this actually has a solution and it is already resolved in other platforms, like if you try the same thing with your Android phone or with some Apple device, it just works because there's this translator there. Uh, if you use Windows, well, it doesn't work unless you plug in a USB modem where the translator is there, but not for other things, but with Linux, yeah, maybe we can do something about it. So we tried uh, to do various things, and uh, the result is that we have a daemon in Python that is listening to Pref64 uh, options in root advertisements, and then, then can configure something uh, based on it. I mean, like local translator, for instance. We have a similar implementation of um, uh, this in Go together with, uh, together with uh, NAT64 prefix discovery by RFC 750, 7050, sorry. And uh, also we have improved the uh, Perl script CLHD, which is available for Linux. It relies on using Taiga, which is user space translator. And now uh, there is a pull request that uh, allows this to support also in kernel translator called NAT46. Uh, but of course, we are still not done. Uh, there is lots of, lo lots of work to do, and probably we need to really convince uh, the developers of uh, tools like Network Manager or 
system D network D, which is the tool that most Linux users are using to configure the network to implement this in that. So uh, yeah, this is our very small team. It's me and uh, my colleague uh, David Chapelik over there and uh, Radek Zaiz has joined us remotely and we have repositories on GitHub for everything. That's it, thank you. PQ in X509 presentation. That's in person. Cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, so the project that we worked on today was PQ and X509. Uh, this project's actually been going on for about a year now. We started it in IETF 115, um, and uh, it's actually grown quite a bit. Um, the NCCOE, for instance, they've taken a look at our project, and because we're doing interoperability testing between these PQ algorithms, and uh, yeah, it's helpful for the work that uh, they're doing too because they're actually looking to standardize these algorithms. So it's nice to, that we can work with them on this as well. So what got done? Um, so one thing that we did, um, because of the new draft uh, NIST release for the, the MLDSA, the ML uh, SLH and ML Ken algorithms, um, so we updated uh, our testing appropriately to support those. So we have an artifact file, because it's a zip file format um, for testing that. Um, so we have updated that format. Um, we've also, we have an OID mapping table because we need to be interoperable. So we've updated us that, uh, that as well to align with the NIST draft specification. Uh, well, it's, it's their prototype OIDs because NIST hasn't given us final OIDs yet until they're standardized, but it's the best we can do at this point. Um, and yeah, we added a, a table that describes uh, the source of the PQ algorithm. So we have a number of different implementations, four unique actually at the moment, which is great for testing. And so what got done? Uh, yeah, so we continue doing our interoperability testing. Um, uh, one thing that uh, our, gr our group is also expanding a little bit into other protocols as well to testing uh, PQ in them. So for instance, CMP. So they're one of the, uh, Alex and our group is look, looking at to adding uh, a CMP interoperability test suite as well. So that's great to see. We've had our first implementation in progress of composite chem as well. Um, also, there was some discussions on the multi-auth for certificate binding. Um, so that draft is being worked on by a few members as well as there's some, been some discussions about how that can interoperate with another draft that's in progress on uh, uh, cert, uh, certificate uh, discovery uh, draft. So uh, yeah, so there's a lot of drafts going on that are adding PQ and we're working on interoperability testing those. And uh, yeah, so there's been six updated R3 uh, zip formats added and uh, a ver verification by some new members. Um, we've updated the compatibility matrix. Um, we had some discussion on chameleon certs. Um, one thing, a number of members, we have a new version of the composite signatures being developed, and so a number of people are updating the draft to the new dash 10 that's come out of that. A couple of things found with that, um, the new compact key is uh, just a little bit challenging to implement, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not a showstop or anything. And there's further discussions on the non-separability strengthening for that uh, draft as well. Just wanted to show you quickly, this is what the that OID mapping table looks like. Um, that aligns to, that kind of aligns itself with the NIST standards. And um, this is just actually hot off the press today. Um, one of our, just this is the MLDSA 65 algorithm. Like I said, that we have a number of implementations that have that now. So this is some initial testing. We actually have one of these for every algorithm. And yeah, so in summary, we've had, we had two new members this time, Dimitri Pravic, who I think was his first time as well. 
and uh, a number of members over the past year, at least 25 people. So thank you to all of you for uh, being part of this. And uh, yeah, you can check out our, uh, our GitHub page there. And we're having a meeting Tuesday, December 5th. We have monthly meetings, so come join us. Thanks. Thanks. Good. Let's check how we are doing. Um, hopefully. Good. Um, next presentation. Dinas. No. Dines delegation or Dines to compression, compressed. Okay, it's the it's a Dines presentation on different topics for sure. There we go. Hello, Bernard got me scared that I forgot about some project, but that's not the case. Uh, we've gathered over 20 people discussing what we can do with DNS. We ended up with six pages full of bullet points with problems in the current protocol. So what can we do? Well, the plan was discussed and on the napkin, we basically fixed half of these six pages. And in the end, there is a implementation of REST info for bind, so that's support for discovering information about the resolver. Uh, there is a work in progress on a notify for the DNSSEC, notifying the parent that the DNSSEC data or metadata has changed, and the parent should fetch the new data. That's also work in progress. And probably the most important part is uh, that we've made some napkin protocol design, how we can even evolve and change the DNS and remove some of its limitations. Essentially, it's very simple. We just introduce a new type of uh, delegation instead of the classical NS type, which is used for like 35 years or how many. We introduce a new type, which allows uh, indirection. And as a new side effect of the new type, we can introduce a new role into the DNS system. So now the, it's not just the servers talking to each other, but we can define a role for DNS operators. So you can say, okay, my domain is operated by my little company, and uh, this domain is operated by Cloudflare, or you can say, okay, this domain is operated by both, and the parameters can be stored indirectly in the different place. So finally, the operator can change the operators, uh, the parameters himself without asking the domain owner, please go to this web interface and change this string of numbers which doesn't make any sense to you to this another string of numbers which also doesn't make any sense to you. So hopefully it will improve the flexibility and at the same time usability of the DNS protocol. Uh, we've learned that we really cannot move a needle without doing changes in the parent site in the registry basically, but we can do it just once and make it extensible. And nice revelation was that we can actually be backwards compatible, so we can allow the new use, case, new use cases at the same time don't break the existing internet, which is kind of nice. And it was over 20 people working on this. Thank you for everyone who contributed. Thank you, Peter. Looking forward for ongoing discussions in Dinosov. Um, next we have, let's see, let's see, let's see we have here, the L4S uh, presentation. They are certainly a long table. All right, hello. Um, so this uh, project is doing uh, interop testing for L4S and accurate ECN. Uh, L4S, for those who haven't heard of it, it's low latency, low loss, scalable throughput. 
It's a new congestion control architecture for the internet. And we've been doing these interrupt events the last several hackathons. Um, and uh, oops. so the plan is um, we're not done. Um, we've just gotten started, actually. Um, so we're running, testing, um, continuing after the hackathon in the ballroom foyer. Uh, so all week long, we'll be there uh, running tests. Um, testing uh, is focused on RFCs uh, 9330, 9331, and 9332, uh, which define the L4S congestion control architecture, the use of the ECN field in the IP header, and, uh, and the dual queue coupled AQM functionality in the network uh, equipment. Um, and then additionally, the accurate ECN draft, which is uh, working its way through TCPM. Um, the network setup that we have here is a, a GPON network that supports L4S uh, congestion marking, as well as a Wi-Fi access point that supports it as well. Um, have seven different congestion control implementations this time, uh, three new ones that uh, have not participated in the previous one. So um, the Netflix rate controller is new, as is the Quick Go uh, prog implementation and uh, Screen V2. Um, so we're looking forward to getting, uh, getting into the testing of those and different mixes of congestion control uh, implementations sharing the bottleneck link. Uh, here's our network setup. Um, so with the PON system in the middle, uh, GPON system and uh, ONUs, and then uh, ability to attach clients and servers to the network, um, as well as to connect to servers that are outside of uh, the local environment here um, out on the internet. Um, and then we have the ability to, um, at vantage points on either side of the network bottleneck, uh, capture traffic and analyze the, um, the behavior of the L4S congestion controller, including um, throughput and latency, packet latency and CE marking and, uh, and statistics on, on those uh, attributes. So far, um, so we've got quite a bit of equipment that uh, has to get set up in order to get running with this. So a lot of the work so far has been getting the PON network up configured, getting that latency monitoring software and hardware uh, set up and, and running. Um, but we have achieved the first test of Netflix rate controller in a real L4S network. So that's, that's a first and hopefully we'll have uh, Again, um, testing of the other new congestion controllers as, as we, we get into the rest of the week. Um, so to wrap up, um, fairly large group from a number of different companies um, that are participating here. Um, three new um, attendees, first timers at the IETF Hackathon. So um, welcome to them. So thank you. Thank you. And you already registered for the Hack Demo Happy Hour tomorrow? Okay, excellent. So just also a general reminder to all of you, of course. I will repeat that later. Thanks. Um, next one is the resumable upload over HTTP. Um, hey, everybody. So we worked on resumable uploads over HTTP. And to have a quick recap, resumable uploads basically allow you to uh, recover from network interruptions or user error or server issues whenever um, you're transferring files. This is not really rocket science. People have been doing this for ages already. Um, but it would be nice to have a standard on this so that we have server and client implementations that work well together. Um, there's already a draft that we're discussing in the HTTPIS working group, um, and we're just here to improve the software side of things a bit. So we set out um, like four challenges that we were able to complete two of them. Uh, we wanted to write some plugins for existing popular HTTP proxies um, to handle resumable uploads directly. Um, we also wanted to create a tool to easily test if a server implements the specification correctly. And um, we also thought about building 
a JavaScript runtime for or like implementing resumable uploads in JavaScript runtimes across all the board, because there's quite a lot nowadays. Um, and we also thought about implementing a polyfill to add resumable uploads into the Fetch API in browsers, um, but we didn't get to those, maybe in the future. What we did get done is, uh, as mentioned, we created a tool that you can point your server to, and then it says like, oh, hey, your uh, server implements the protocol correctly, or there are these and that issues, um, which is really great for ensuring that all of the implementations actually work together in a proper way. We also um, worked on integrating resumable uploads directly into proxies, the way it would work that it receives all of the resumable uploads, and once an upload is complete, it could then forward it to the application server. Um, and the nice benefit of this is that you don't need an application server that is actually able to handle resumable uploads because the proxy will take care of um, handling all of this. Um, and we were able to implement this in the caddy proxy because that was really easy. Um, we also tried it for Nginx, but it was a bit more challenging. Um, but in the end, it's working, um, and it's a great proof of concept. So yeah, what did we learn? Well, as mentioned, we see that implementing resumable uploads in proxies is quite handy and doable. It provides quite a few benefits. Um, we, in the beginning, we were not sure about whether like, those informational responses would work properly with proxies, because they're not always that easy to use, but it didn't turn out to be a problem. And our uh, automatic conform conformity tool was actually able to find a few issues in our implementation, so that's, that's great. Um, yeah, in the end, uh, a big thanks to all of uh, the participants, especially Merlin, Jonathan, Travis, and Piotr. Um, that's our draft. Uh, we're going to discuss it on Friday in the HTTP BIS session. So if you're interested, feel free to join. Thank you. Okay, there we are. The next presentation is the Yang Revision Label presentation. Okay. So, yeah. Here you go. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Per Andersson. Uh, this is a hackathon for the Netmod group where we discuss uh, uh, module versioning and semantic versioning for Yang uh, models. So uh, we have these extensions, revision label, and recommended min, where this is a normal uh, uh, Yang module revision today with a revision date. Uh, but these drafts, and I missed the Netmod in the draft names, but uh, <clears throat> It adds revision label, which you can annotate your revisions with, and uh, an extension for imports. You can annotate imports as well. And also maybe changing the uh, uh, final format for Yang models with this hash instead of the at revision date. We have a hash revision label. So this is what a revision label would look like, uh, annotation, and this is what a uh, recommended min would look like. So the idea was to create a proof of concept for the PN compiler to understand this, and that was done. So next steps is to take this battle to NetMod and uh, uh, see if we can uh, reach rough consensus on it. But now at least there's code for it. Um, and looking into the other tooling, uh, Yang compilers, etc. Thank you. Thanks. Next presentation uh, is the Sustainable Insights presentation. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Um, I'm a computer science guy, but more than that, I'm a sustainability buff. So I got into this telemetry stuff by, uh, I wanted to measure the, the energy consumption of servers and equipment in the networks. And not only the total energy, but also the specific customer A, B, and C, how much do they consume so that we can bill them for all the energy they are consuming in my equipment. You've probably seen a lot of graphs like this. I have at least. Uh, yay, we got something, moved, lines are moving and all that. So uh, time series telemetry is something that's done. You don't, I mean, you have seen it a lot, so it, it exists out there. But actually, um, we get a lot of really nice graphs, but as soon as you start to ask, what's actually included here? Uh, is the cooling included? What's the precision? Is this real or reactive power? The, the guys showing the graph, so say, uh, uh, second, John, do you know? So it, it's, um, it looks nice, but we don't really know what we're measuring. Can I take these numbers over here, add them to these numbers over here? Or is the data overlapping? We don't know. Can I compare the numbers that are coming from this vendor with the numbers from that vendor? So I pick the equipment that uh, has the best performance? We don't know. So even though we have all this time series telemetry in place, we don't know if that's really useful today. So we have a lot of work to do. So one of the drafts that is uh, being presented now in, um, in the OPS AWG uh, and also in uh, NetMod and NetConf groups is a mapping from Yang to uh, the time series database formats. It's a sort of tag format that they use in all the time series databases so that we can easier integrate and know what we are showing in the graph. So we can directly see uh, in the time series databases where this data came from, which field are we reading from which device. And all the, the metadata, is this real power, is this reactive power, and so on. Uh, we have an open source project that we wanted to work on. Uh, since this is a plugin architecture that we're presenting, some drafts you will see at the end, um, we wanted to have a reference framework, sort of. It's an open source project. And we worked on adding a netconf polling ingester into Telegraph there, so we can read any sort of REST conf uh, data from servers or network equipment. And here's the team. Uh, we have a green monitoring GitHub project for this. Uh, we had a lot of interesting discussions with uh, a lot of other people that saw what we were doing, came in by the table, it was very nice. And if you're interested in these sort of topics, here are some drafts you can have a look at. Thank you very much. Next is uh, the draft from Momoka, who will give the presentation. This is the IPv6 only resolver. Uh, Tobias, there you go. Yeah, um, so welcome everyone. Um, this is indeed about uh, the draft uh, Momoka wrote about uh, using NAT64 in DNS servers. Um, the basic plan for the hackathon was to um, actually, well, have the draft Momoka wrote, which an LNAPS, uh, an L NetLabs implemented, um, actually set up on some form of public resolver and throw a couple of queries against it to see if something breaks and also to figure out whether prefer IPv6 is a thing you should do if you configure your DNS server with um, NAT64 according to the draft. 
Um, so we got that kind of done. So there's a semi-public uh, resolver, um, which is like fully v6 only and only does um, DNS resolution for v4 addresses over net64, um, 2a06 d1c7. A um, little bit of rate limiting, not too much. Um, we figured out that um, setting prefer IPv6 is a sensible thing to do. So um, once again, Momokar was right. Um, because otherwise you will start seeing queries being pulled through the net64 for dual stack hosts, which you could reach via native IPv6, which of course is not ideal. Um, apart from that, something to debug in the future is to see whether uh, DNS recursion behind a net64 might lead to port starvation. If you have just too many short-lived connections, <clears throat> I mean, in parallel, there was a discussion about long-lived TCP connections for BGP people, meaning weeks, and for DNS people, meaning like two queries in one session. So um, yeah, you might run out of ports in your net64. So basically, you can use this host, a bit of rate, um, that go, uh, well, rate limiting going on, and it would be kind of nice to see a little bit of traffic to see if something breaks. And if something breaks, um, just complain to me. Oh, by the way, few doubt. Not affiliated to that anymore, but it's my favorite domain, which doesn't have v6. Uh, so, thanks. Thank you, Tobias. And uh, credits to figuring out the problems with uh, DST and uh, the GitHub uh, Actions Pipeline. Anomaly, let's put it that way. The next presentation is... Scroll down more and more. Yep, it's the uh, NTP presentation, uh, the Hackathon NTP table. I think they were in the room. Yep. Okay, so um, as the NTP working group, uh, we plan to work on a couple of things. One is get the NTP v5 draft support in a full uh, NTP implementation, so uh, basically one of the big four ones. Um, we wanted to also get it working with NTS, that wasn't tried before, so um, that was one of our goals. And we did some further exploration of the rough time draft. For the rough time draft, we don't have any real concrete results for the other stuff. What we've done is we've managed to get NTP v5 support uh, integrated in NTP DRS. Um, this is completely in the main branch of the thing, so it should be there in the next release. Um, we've got a public test server for NTP v5 up at the address on the screen. This also includes NTS support. Um, it will probably remain up for the next week or so. Um, after that, I might move the server to another place. Um, we'll see about that. Uh, so that's the main results we got. Uh, we've learned a few things. There's still some discussion to be had on the upgrade protocol. So for moving from NTPv4 to NTPv5, there's a handshake that can be done in NTPv4. Um, especially for drafts right now, we are still figuring out how to do that in a way that won't shoot us in the foot for the future. And we needed some minor draft changes to get NTS support working because we forgot to assign some identifiers. Whoops. Um, so that's about it. Uh, the relevant standards are on the board, uh, as well as the link to the implementation. And I'd like to thank all our team members. Let's see, where are we now? Yep. Next one is the on path telemetry presentation. Go. Hi. 
you select the right arrow. Uh, hello, everyone. Our tema is uh, IP fix uh, on path telemetry with SRB6. In this hackathon, we aim to collect hop by hop delay on SRB6 packet. We implement IEs to Huravia exporter. That is an IP fix exporter with eBPF, XTP, and Wireshark dissectors. Um, uh, this is our result. We, comp uh, we completed implementation of IPFIX on past delay to Flavia exporter and implementation of Wireshark dissector of IP uh, IPFIX on past delay. This is our implementation environment. In this network, we collect on past delay metric from each SRB6 node using Flavia exporter. Flavia exporter collects timestamps using IOAM. Then calculate each link's delay and export it through IP fix. And this is the internal structure of Flavia exporter. Flavia exporter mainly uh, uh, comprises three components, capturer, meter, and exporter. Flavia exporter uses eBPF and XP, XDP in order to monitor the packets in the Linux router in a secure manner uh, with a minimal performance uh, degree. This is pipeline of uh, exporting on pass telemetry. First, capturer collects SRB6 packet with IOM header and timestamps of when the packet arrived. And then meter calculated each on pass delay using timestamps and pass the SRP6 SR header. Finally, exported generated the IPFIX packet and send it to IPFIX collector. Uh, this is a Wireshark screenshot. We, succeed, we succeeded dissect the uh, pass delay I use. Uh, here is our code and uh, my team member. Thank you. Next presentation is IP Mon Hackathon Project. I have a screen share for right. Yeah. Okay, hello. Uh, this is uh, John Paul John. Um, um, today uh, I will present the uh, IP by the six mobile object networking hackathon project. Uh, this is uh, the poster for this hackathon project. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, this hackathon project, we try to um, set up simulation environment uh, for 5G based um, drone or um, urban air mobility communication system for safe and secure flight using ITF protocols. Also, we try to demonstrate the feasibility of um, vehicular mobility information option for uh, safe for flying. So this figure shows the left hand side. Uh, this is the uh, layout uh, for three dimensional uh, drone uh, highway. So we have uh, uh, three layers. We can make any uh, uh, layers. So also we make uh, each uh, layer uh, treat uh, terrestrial roadways. We try to make a cube, uh, some three uh, dimensional highway. And then uh, right hand side, uh, OMNet++ plus plus, um, is used to um, simulate. So we uh, use the uh, simul 5G because this communication uh, is based on um, 5G, V2X, and IP version 6 and IP version 4. Um, this time, uh, we demonstrate IP version um, 4 based uh, drone network first. So. Uh, this figure shows left hand side. This is a uh, protocol stack, 3GPP under uh, lane uh, uh, layers. On top of it, uh, we have a logical uh, link layer LLC to support any kind of uh, medium, uh, such as wave or Bible vertex, something like that. And then uh, on top of LLC, uh, we support IP version 4 or IP version 6. And 
uh, line side, we have uh, OMNet plus plus. So this time, uh, my uh, PhD student, uh, BNME, uh, implemented uh, this uh, OMNet plus plus uh, 5G VTX uh, user equipment uh, protocol stack. So uh, we have a draft IP uh, wave uh, context aware navigation protocol. Uh, it is called the vehicular uh, mobility uh, information option. So uh, this is uh, uh, Hackathon GitHub project, and this is uh, YouTube. So uh, we got uh, the feasibility of um, our um, the draft. So next time we try to implement IP version six. So this is our team and our portal. So thank you. So, so I have so hello uh, again uh, this is a jam project um uh, this one is for um, intent-based uh, network management automation and project. So uh, this is a poster. Um, the goal of this um, hackathon project, we tried to set up uh, IP, uh, the 5G network testbed for um, 5G-based uh, intent-based networking. Uh, we are using 3GPP intent-driven uh, management services. So we're using uh, open sources like open 5GS and uh, software uh, define the radio SRS uh, uh, LAN. Uh, this figure, so uh, our goal is uh, you can see um, upside we have IBM intent based user. Uh, this is uh, the, some odometer later give, for example, two uh, IoT devices. It can be um, measured using IoT server uh, using a uh, 5G network. So that intent, uh, intent is a kind of, you know, the what? rather than how. So that kind of intent abstraction delivered to uh, IBM controller translate, and then they um, deliver a network exporter function and configure core network and uh, radio access network, and then UE and the server can communicate. So basically this custom we set up um, this um, 5G network testbed. So basically upside is um, the core network and radio unit, and downside is user equipment for IoT devices. We use uh, USRT devices. So uh, we set up um, a 5G core network, radio network, and configured the um, uh, uh, MF, access man, uh, man, uh, mobility management function, and um, UPF, and other, you know, SMF, something like that. So we demonstrate the communication between uh, two uh, devices. Uh, this is an uh, open source project. Uh, even though this is the uh, initial state, uh, we try to keep uh, working on it. And this is uh, our demonstration for test bed. So uh, we learned how to um, configure 5G core network and the access network. And next step, uh, we try to um, figure out how to translate using um, intent translator so my student and I are working for that. And then our next uh, ITF 109, uh, we will implement and demonstrate intent-based network management automation. So this is the team. Uh, this is collaborated with the uh, University Professor Young An Kim and the Atri and my student and uh, Nobuo uh, Aoki from Japan. Okay, thank you for your attention. presentation is the LLTCP, long-lived TCP, GNS monitoring presentation. Cool. 
Ε, Perfect. Thank you. So in our little hackathon project uh, yesterday and today, we looked for um, long-lasting multi-query um, TCP sessions, DNS over TCP, basically. And the idea is really that we wanted to test if implementations, measurement implementations, handle DNS over TCP correctly. Um, in tools that I've seen in the past, in the, in the, in the past 20 years, some implementations that measure DNS over TCP, they require seeing the um, uh, session establishment first, the SYNAC. Um, if you have data stored in, in, in PCAP files, the session setup might be in a different PCAP file than the actual um, payload. The other problem is that there are tools that assume that there's only a single DNS uh, query response pair over a TCP session. So we decided to just check for these uh, long lasting TCP sessions, multi query TCP sessions, and then replay them against um, some well known tools. Um, we didn't do the second part. Um, we had multiple approaches to, to getting those um, long lasting TCP sessions out of um, PCAP data. We used the DITL data set from DNS ORC to do this. Um, what we've learned, um, these long-lasting DNS, uh, DNS over TCP sessions are extremely rare. I don't want to say non-existent, just because we didn't find any, and we did look thoroughly through the DNS uh, digital data set. Um, um, basically, the bulk, almost 99% of all traffic that I've observed um, on the digital data set had a single query over a TCP session. Um, and there's a lot of brokenness in there. There are um, query restarts, session restarts, session resets in the middle of, in the middle of, of, a, of a transmission. Um, you see scanners doing bulk um, DNS queries. Um, you see an enormous amount of um, resolvers, uh, well-known resolvers that have parallel TCP sessions all doing a single query all at the same time. Um, so, there is definitely room for improvement, but that's not what we set out to do. We just set out to, to check if DNS tools were under-reporting TCP. Apparently, they are not, so that's a good thing. Um, these are our team members on the screen on the left, and for the tools that we've used, they have been uploaded to GitHub. Thank you. It's going well now. Next presentation is uh, Effective Commitment Based on Proof of Transit presentation in person. Great. So, left and right. Yeah, okay. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to present our new work, the Vector Commitment Based Proof of Transit. Um, right, so basically what we do is that we design and implement a new proof of transit mechanism. So what is a proof of transit mechanism, you may ask? Uh, it's a mechanism that proves that a packet has uh, traversed a series of um, nodes, it could be physical device, or it could be virtual functions uh, in a specific order. So basically this problem was uh, studied in the SFC working group um, uh, and there's was a old draft, and we are focusing on the same problem. And what we do is that we provide a working alternative, uh, but more efficiency and security. Um, so what it can do is that it can help audit um, the routing path of a packet or monitor it um, uh, in the operations. Uh, and the code is right there in the GitHub and uh, it's very easy to, to run. Uh, right now it's in the proof of uh, concept stage. And uh, there's also video and uh, picture demo inside. So the difference that we compare to the old uh, solution is that they are using a cryptographic primitive called the Shamir secret sharing. And we are using something different. We're using vector commitment, uh, specifically the KZG polynomial commitment uh, for some 
who may be interested in blockchain or the uh, zero knowledge proof space. Uh, this is using the um, pairing friendly elliptic curves. And uh, the results in here is that um, the, the size of the transit proof is constant. Um, thanks to the, um, this primitive itself, we didn't actually modify the primitive at all. Um, the transit proof that is added to each packet is 24 bytes and is regardless of the length of your routing path. And the time of computing such transit proof for each router is uh, one to two milliseconds, uh, regardless of the length of the path uh, also. So um, this is basically, I think this is, I think this is too small, but uh, the upper left side is the controller and the rest are all routers. And basically what it can do is that every router will um, uh, compute his own transit proof and to see if I am in the right position of a path. And also it can verify other people's transit proofs and see if other people is in the right position of his path. And this is the right and wrong uh, example. So what we learn is that it's a um, vector commitment is an um, interesting primitive that has the position binding you know, property. And it's very nice to commit a routing path and verify the actual forwarding of the results. And uh, we have pre uh, previously proposed to the OPSEC working group. And uh, what we learned is that we are doing a proof of transit and not a proof of non-transit, which will be hard and we cannot do that right now. And we read these still better use cases to be presented in the security dispatch. And uh, uh, if you like it, you can comment there. And if you don't like it, you can hit it there. And uh, for concluded uh, SFC working group, um, we discovered a new solution after you close. Sorry, thank you. Okay, we see the end now. The hackathon tie dye is over there. Yeah. Okay, that's the right buttons. So thank you. Hello, my name is Bart from Cisco, and uh, in the tie-dye hackathon, we uh, wanted to try seamless onboarding of a headless IoT device or headless IoT devices in enterprise environments. And um, in this case, it were uh, BLE devices, and so we also wanted uh, web apps to be able to talk to those BLE devices. Uh, we used two drafts for that, a uh, scheme for devices for onboarding, and then uh, non-IP control for the uh, communication with the BLE devices. Um, so what we were trying to solve was um, we were trying to test and improve an open source implementation of tie-dye, uh, which was released just a few weeks ago. And we were gonna build a demo app that um, uses uh, several BLE devices to um, monitor uh, room environmentals in this room to basically prove that it's really cold here. Um, and uh, the bonus that we got was a, a very, very challenging RF environment. So we learned quite a few things uh, with that as well. So we improved the tie-dye open source project and we implemented a CI CD as well. How did, how did we go about it? So um, um, basically, so we built an app that uses uh, the SKIM for devices provisioning protocol that provisions a, a network gateway. So we did that both with the open source and the Cisco implementation. And then after provisioning, we used um, Nipsey to talk to a BLE controller that enabled us to set up bi-directional communication with um, uh, the BLE device and also um, start or register pub sub topics uh, so we could stream device telemetry uh, to the application as well. What we got done, so A, we got uh, the network up and running, uh, 
both leveraging the open source code as well as a Cisco implementation. Um, it took us quite some time to figure out how to handle this noisy environment. So we went from kind of not being able to uh, interpret anything to uh, being able to reliably talk to our PLE devices. Uh, we um, performed code improvements in CI/CD in, on, uh, on the open source, and we built this web app that monitors the uh, room temperature. And for some reason, uh, when we took this screenshot, it was quite a bit warmer than it is right now. Um, what we got for free was this wonderfully noisy environment, which we didn't re don't really see in our labs or, uh, or, or uh, when we test. Um, our team members, uh, Elliot, uh, Rohit, and uh, myself, and two-thirds of us were uh, first-timers. And uh, um, the, uh, the uh, GitHub repo for Tyrai is uh, right over there. Thank you. So we're nearing the end. We're a little bit running over time, but we're, that's fine. The uh, PQ-ETH presentation. Right here, oh yeah. All right, so um, this is um, um, our work that on the hackathon about uh, making a post-quantum um, version of um, encrypted client hello. So a few things about protocols practically sitting on top of TLS 1.3. The idea is to be able to provide a, a certain level of privacy on top of uh, TLS 1.3 by encrypting even the first message has been exchanged, which is the client hello. Practically, what we tried to do was to make um, the blue part, which is the uh, inner uh, client hello, uh, which is encrypted in ECH, uh, post-quantum. Um, for that, um, ECH is using uh, HPKE, um, a specific uh, uh, key encapsulation mechanism based on elliptic curves. And we tried to change that modify that into, in order to become uh, post-quantum. So we're using uh, three practical RFCs, the TLS 1.3 RFC, RFC 9180, which is the HPKE, <coughs> and the encrypted uh, uh, client hello uh, RFC. Um, our implementation was based on uh, the Wolf SSL um, uh, C code based library uh, that provides uh, partially some support for uh, post quantum crypto algorithms in combination with li the libOQS uh, library. Um, yeah. So, what did we do? So, what we actually got done uh, is that we made uh, HPK post quantum. Uh, we also made some benchmarks and uh, we had some measurements of the performance of post-quantum HPKE. We had some issues. Uh, the post-quantum algorithms provide significantly bigger artifacts, uh, and we had some issues on, uh, on, on using Kyber uh, on, as a key exchange mechanism because it has some differences from the elliptic curve diffie uh, So the making ECH post-quantum uh, is still a work in progress. And we have some measurements. Uh, here we can see in the figure that the post-quantum HPK performs significantly, significantly faster than the, the classical one. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> we just measure here operations uh, per second. Yeah. So it's the, the bigger, the better. All right, and just to wrap up, uh, the team involved uh, me, myself, Apostolos Furnaris, uh, George Sopoulos, and Evangelos Haleplitis. All of us are from the Industrial System Institute for Research Center in Greece. I was really enjoying 
being here with all of you guys. Thanks. Okay. So next presentation is the core ACE lake table. COSI, so, sorry. So the COSI uh, implementation in Rust presentation. So hello everybody, my name is Giovanni. This is my first participation in the IETF. Uh, I'm very glad that I'm with a very good team. So this is uh, all a team effort that I'm presenting. So I'll talk about uh, ephemeral Diffie-Hellman over COSIN. So you already see so what is COSIN. Um, and I will talk about uh, something on top of COSIN and specifically the implementation in Rust that we are working. So as a recap, uh, ephemeral Diffie-Hellman of Ercose is a way to derive secret keys and um, encode it in Cose. And the main thing is that uh, we can use this in IoT environments where the networks are very, very restricted. So if you see here, the minimum handshake we can achieve is 101 bytes. So that is for three messages. So the messages are really, really small. Uh, we have a microcontroller optimized implementation of the ad, ad hoc in Rust. Uh, it's, uh, we have some effort towards form verification. Uh, I will skip for this and focus on what we did. Uh, so basically, we, we improved the processing following some implementations guideline drafts that have been worked uh, by Marco. And uh, we discussed it a lot. It was a very good opportunity to improve this implementation. Uh, we support uh, credentials sent by value or by reference. We improve it uh, EAD, which means that the protocol can be extended. So we improved the processing of these extensions of ad hoc. Uh, we had uh, great uh, contributions on the cryptographic backends that now use the Rust traits, which makes them way more flexible. We also uh, now are almost there supporting message flow as type states, which means that during compilation time, we know that the message flow cannot go wrong, which is very nice. And uh, we are just about making it work to have a doc Rust run uh, in a uh, demonstration co-op server uh, connected with Riot OS. And we also have plans to, to have a demo of a new draft of an extension of ad hoc uh, but that it's for the next time. Okay, thank you. So we will now. Um, this is the last presentation I have in Meet Echo. So if there are other people that submitted the presentation and have not being scheduled. We can go over somewhere to Barry over there. Maybe he can resolve that issue. Otherwise, this is the last presentation. Okay. Thank you. Being the last. <laughs> um, in our group, we worked on the attested CSR. That's work that is mainly being done in the LAMPS working group, but there's also, uh, reu it reuses mechanisms from RATS and, and other groups. Um, our plan was the following. We had uh, mainly one document from LAMPS, as mentioned, um, with sort of references going into RATS and uh, another document specifying an extension to ESD and CMP. And our plan was to create a full POC in these one and a half days um, with three parties, a verifier, uh, the relying party, the CA, and the attester in the style of the RATS architecture. Um, at the beginning, we weren't quite sure what we should do, so we switched implementations a couple of times, which proved to be uh, not so useful. Um, 
It took uh, much longer. We at the end settled uh, for an ESD-based implementation. Uh, you implemented in Go, and we used the Verizon verifier. Uh, we noticed a couple of uh, problems with the documents that we've been using, which uh, obviously need to be resolved. So that's uh, a good lesson learned for us. We filed uh, issues, and yeah, we didn't manage to complete the, the BOC as, as we wanted. So there's some further work for us to do at the end of the or during this week, and, and hopefully till the end of the week. We had also lots of good conversations, so uh, that was a lot of fun, but uh, not a smooth progress as we were hoping. But we should know we have been at all of the hackathons so far, so um, not a surprise. Thank you. Thank you. So that was the last presentation. I would like to thank all the participants, all the presenters, of course. It has been a great weekend, a lot of interactions, uh, also social interactions. Um, I was happy to see that. So it's not only coding, coding, it's also talking with people, cross-pollination, etc. And, and I really enjoyed it to see it. Um, two, three things I want to mention before closing. So please sign up or register yourself for the Hack Demo Happy Hour tomorrow at 6.30. You can do that, you follow on the wiki, uh, the Hackathon Wiki, you can find the links to register yourself. Other thing, I would like to thank the Secretariat, the people from AMS, who was really, really important to make this happen and make it, well, running very smooth. Um, and finally, I would like to thank, of course, our running code sponsors, Ericsson, Meta, uh, Cianic, and ICANN. Uh, they made it possible to organize it this weekend. Uh, they provided food and drinks and uh, a very enjoyable uh, weekend. So thank you all and thank the sponsors. <laughs> and the knock too. Yeah, thank you, Elliot. And the knock, of course, uh, running an excellent uh, network. Thank you, Elliot. And see you around this week. Happy to talk about uh, how we can improve the hackathon. Just drop me, uh, tap, tap me on my shoulder or drop me an email or the other uh, uh, hackathon co-chairs. Thanks. <laughs>